Hi, I'm Faye Fahrenheit, and um, I want to make a response uh, video and discussion to uh, the video that Unnatural Vegan recently made about autism. I have autism, and I wanted to talk about some of the things she said in the video. Uh, this, litter, th this video is sort of like an open letter directly to her, and I, I personally hope she watches the video. So, um, I guess where to begin? These are uh, my brother's ashes. Uh, he was mentally handicapped, um, and he was terminally ill. He had congestive heart failure and 30% uses of his lungs. Um, my mother was abusive, and she she really didn't like the fact that I was autistic, and she really didn't like the fact that she had two disabled kids that she was responsible for. And so um, when I was 16 um, and in high school, she kicked us both out and I was homeless while caring for um, my mentally handicapped brother who was dying. Um, he, he was terminally ill. He died when I was 19. And I was also going to high school. And, you know, so I, I have cared for a person who's severely disabled before is what I'm trying to say. And also, I think it's important not to presume um, what I'm capable of based on the fact that I can talk to you in this video. Um, I have, in the past, struggled with autistic self-injury. I used to pull my hair out. Um, there had been times where I would pluck all my eyelashes out um, or pluck out all my eyebrow hairs. And then I would just uh, do compulsive, really, really destructive skin picking. Like, I would dig giant craters in my skin. And um, I also cannot drive a car. I'm almost 29 and still cannot drive a car. Um, but I'm here to talk about um, why I think Swayze said some things um, in her video that were just really mind-bogglingly sensitive. And I, I hope she doesn't it, take this as a personal attack, but I am probably going to get emotional. Because I have, I have a lot of stuff to say um, about what she said. Um, I have my, my brother's little um, cremation certificate right here. It's an image you know. So before I begin with my criticisms of Swayze specifically, I, I do want to say that I appreciate the fact that she said some positive things in her video. Um, I appreciate the fact that she spoke out against uh, pseudoscientific therapies for autism and the anti-vaccine movement, as well as the idea of using a raw food vegan diet to cure your child's autism. Um, however, I do think that she said some things that, although she may not have intended to be hurtful or condescending or um, insensitive, were pretty insensitive. And I, I would just like to talk about that. And I hope that people understand that it's not, it's not an attack on her. Like, it's actually one of my favorite uh, YouTube channels. And I am a, a vegan myself. But here we go. My criticisms of Swayze. Again, there's no cure for autism right now. Um, there is optimal outcome, but that does not happen for the vast majority of people with autism. And there's no way to make that happen, to make someone with autism outgrow it. So she talks about optimal outcome at several points in the video, and I, I don't think she uh, realizes she's referring to something that has actually been studied by autism professionals and in, in the autistic community is referred to as masking or passing. It's absorbing and observing the speech, mannerisms, character, even persona of someone who is successful. You become a mimic. Popular with the peers, because you can do various people's voices. You can do the chemistry teacher's voice or voices of people on television and actually enjoying and using speech and drama lessons which are used and this is your role, this is your script, this is the person you'll become. The real you must be hidden and must be hidden because they may not like the real you but you have now created a persona that you must maintain. Again, talking with a teenage girl with Asperger's last week, she said, I, I've got this fake me but, but do I let other people into my real world of who I really am because they may not like me? Do I keep up the pretense? And I said, if you do, you're going to get 
actually quite depressed because the amount of energy that goes into that fake person is going to destroy you and also the feeling that the real me is that despicable. I've got to hide it. Pretending to be normal. I have done such a great job of pretending to be normal that nobody really believes I have Asperger's. Again, when you meet that person in a clinic or GP surgery, you think, ah, oh, they're so good, they're so engaged, they have lovely eye contact. But what you find is, when you're talking to the parents and she's in the waiting area, she's fast asleep because she's absolutely exhausted, or after a while, the wheels fall off and you suddenly realize she can't cope with it anymore and the real person is starting to come through. I just spent the last seven years masking my way through a marriage. Now the divorce has gone through. I can finally let the mask down and breathe. I will never put myself through something like that again. It's not just that social etiquette is harder for us to understand. It's that a lot of behaviors and stimming that are natural and healthy for us are considered inappropriate. We have to suppress a need to do things rather than simply not doing them. Think of your own examples from a perspective of someone with Tourette syndrome. It's not just harder to understand. It's harder to comply. It's like the difference between a spy and an immigrant. Sure, we'll both will have to learn the customs of their new country, but the spy will take a significantly higher level of effort to maintain because they not only do have to learn the customs, they have to hide who they really are at all times. Oh boy, where do I even start? I did this, masking, for over nine years, and I am still to this day in the deepest depression you can get. I have literally no motivation or will to carry on, so just let the world drag me. Have you ever masked for so much of your life that you literally have no effing idea what's the mask and what's actually you? You will feel so much better with the mask off. Of course, there will be people who are less tolerant of your differences, but those people aren't worth your time anyway, so don't worry about them. Just find people who like the real you, and you will be better off. I think the hardest part is accepting and embracing who we really are, but once we get past that hurdle, life becomes so much easier. This person says, To be fair, usually when I see an autistic person talking about masking, they talk about it as if it is a uniquely autistic phenomenon, but their descriptions sound like normal social interaction. You really do have to emphasize how difficult or hard it is for you, because the whole faking things you don't actually feel believe is something everybody does. But autistic people have to do it on a whole other level. No neurotypical person gets burnout so severe that they can't live independently anymore or have to stop working in their 40s, but that happens to autistic people. There is a difference between changing how you act to fit the people you are with in the situations you're in, which most people do, in the intense micromanaging and repressing that autistic people who mask have to do. Yeah, people just don't get it. It fucking kills you. I practice my facial expressions in the mirror. Um, you know, I have to practice what I'm going to say and things like that. Um, it's not a minor amount of effort. Y you basically are acting all of the time, and it's incredibly draining. Um, a lot of people experience severe burnout and they like are unable to work then they become suicidal and they become depressed from masking because you know you're not just repressing harmful things and you're not just repressing um things that are inconsequential to who you are you are suppressing aspects of your personality which are inherent to who you are as a person which are socially unacceptable simply because they're weird or unusual. For example, stimming, there is a mind-body disconnect, so like my body will just point at something, and I won't have any control over that. And so autistic people do engage in um, involuntary body movements, which we are judged for and expected to stop engaging in, even though we may not even be consciously aware that we're doing it. Um, for example, I'll talk to myself and I'll make hand gestures, and I'll just be like, you know, I'll just like talk to myself or whatever. People treat it like it's a behavior problem rather than a neurological problem. And when I have been in, uh, in public, whether I've been at work or at grocery stores, um, you know, so and so forth, I've been profiled. Um, I've had, you know, people called the police um, because, you know, I'm stimming and uh, they think that means that I'm on drugs or that I'm dangerous. Um, you know, I've been randomly submitted to drug testing and jobs because of the fact that I, you know, have these unusual behaviors. And um, I have been fired from three jobs for, you know, acting autistic, not in a way that hurt anybody, but just in a way that made me different. And uh, I don't think you understand how hard it is. You have to constantly put on a mask and pretend to be someone you're not. 
because other people aren't nice enough. They're not good enough. They're not they're not kind enough to actually accept you for who you are. And so you have to pretend that you don't have a disability to survive. And if you don't do it, if you don't pretend you don't have a disability, the world will eat you alive. You don't understand what autistic people are dealing with. And so this optimal outcome is optimal for non-autistic people because they don't have to deal with how unusual we are or what our needs are. But it's certainly not optimal for us. Um, I was reading in an article recently that autistic people have an average age of death of 36 <clears throat> and suicide is a leading cause. <clears throat> it's not unsurprising that so many of us attempt to kill ourselves when we are so heavily penalized for being different. Not necessarily for making social mistakes, but just for being different. I remember once I was at work, <clears throat> and I was in the bathroom at work, and uh, this lady saw me stimming, and she saw me talking to myself, and so uh, she went and told everybody uh, that I was crazy, and that I was probably on meth, and uh, she went to the manager, said that I was a drug addict. And so, you know, you can control a little bit of the stimming if you're, like, hyper aware of it. If you're basically, like, super, 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 super focused on everything that you're doing. So it, it puts you in this hyper-vigilant mental state where you're monitoring your own movements and everything. I mean, how you breathe, your facial expressions. Are you smiling? Are we doing hand gestures right now? Am I supposed to touch anybody's hands? Am I supposed to be making this face? Am I supposed to be making that face? What am, am I supposed to be talking? Am I not? You're just like hyper monitoring yourself. You're not living. You're just engaging these acts of hyper monitoring yourself to make sure you don't look autistic. Because if you look autistic, you know what's going to happen to you. You know people are going to treat you like shit. But the problem is that it's very hard to get people to accommodate you or take you seriously in the workplace. And uh, autism is extremely stigmatized, and the purpose of the neurodiversity movement is to combat that stigma. It is also to educate people about why autistic people do the things that we do and um, why we feel autism is a part of our identity, including many of these nonverbal autistic advocates like Carly Fletchman and Ido. And so I want people to understand that in some respects, and I'm not saying being transgender or being gay is a disability, but in some respects, there is an overlap between um, what it is like to be in the closet as a trans person and what it is like to be in the closet as an autistic person. And there are plenty of posts you can find all over the internet on um, various autism websites for people who, you know, participate in those forums saying, you know, how do I come out uh, at work? How do I pass? You know, these are questions that trans people ask and gay people ask. How do I come out to my family? How do I come out to my friends? How do I come out to my coworkers? And in, in all of these posts, you'll see the same things like, okay, well, you know, you could come out, but just be careful. Are you safe? Are you in a safe place? Are people going to hurt you? Are bad things going to happen to you? And, like, I think Swayze just doesn't understand how hard autistic people have it. I think Swayze doesn't understand. Um, that because of who we are, we're more likely to be shot by the police. Because of who we are, we're more likely to be sexually abused. 70, 70, 70 percent of autistic people have been sexually abused. The reality of the situation is that we face an enormous amount of stigmatization and social exclusion that is the result of sociological factors. And that is to not to in any way deny the challenges that may be innate to autism itself but it feels as if in your video you you create this false dichotomy between like neurodiversity advocates and people who acknowledge that autism is a disability and there is no dichotomy in real life between those two things the reality is that the neurodiversity movement doesn't even just include people who have autism it even includes people who have traumatic brain injuries and nobody is out advocating the idea that it's a good idea to go give yourself a traumatic brain injury in order to support neurodiversity. The inspirational Greta Thunberg is a more recent example. She once wrote on Facebook that Asperger is not a disease, it's a gift. And this should highlight the big problem with the neurodiversity movement. 
Asperger, which used to be its own diagnosis, now it's just part of the ASD diagnosis, autism spectrum disorder, is a mild form of autism. Generally, these are people who have average to above average intelligence who can live you know, basically normal lives. They can function on their own. They can live on their own. They can communicate. These are the people on the spectrum advocating for neurodiversity, advocating for not finding a cure for autism because the other people with autism can't advocate for anything. I think that a natural vegan or Swayze mischaracterizes the neurodiversity movement uh, pretty grossly in her video. She says things that are, are frankly wrong, such as uh, the idea that the only people who support neurodiversity have Asperger's syndrome um, or mild autism, when in fact there are many proponents of neurodiversity who, like my brother, were mentally handicapped, or like Ido Kedar, I have, a, I have his book right here, he's a He's a nonverbal autistic boy who can only communicate through uh, typing. He wrote this book when he was in high school. So in the video, she says the only people who support neurodiversity are people who have quote unquote mild autism. Um, this is categorically untrue. I want to go over a lot of non-speaking activists shortly. But um, before I do that, I want to read this little section from the Rational Wiki article on the autism rights movement. Um, opposition. People oppose, uh, opposed to the autism rights movement include, and then they have a, a bunch of people listed here, but on it, it's what Swayze said, people who believe that autistics fall into a scientifically debunked dichotomy of either mild or severe, um, along with the alt-right, conspiracy theorists, anti-vaxxers, good company here. Critics of the movement argue that anyone on the autism spectrum who is able to express their desire not to be cured must have Asperger's syndrome. Lenny Schaefer argues that if every use of autism were changed to read Asperger's Syndrome, then the movie might make sense. But this ignores the fact that the autism rights movement includes people who are diagnosed with, quote, classic autism rather than Asperger's, that some of them are unable to speak, walk, date, or do other everyday tasks in life. Some critics claim that the autism rights movement says that autism is not a disability, despite proponents of the autism rights movement constantly referring to autism, guess what, dun 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 dun, as a disability. Miss, Miss Swayze in her video says nonverbal autistic people cannot be advocates, but there are so many uh, nonverbal autism advocates who are amazing people. The first one I want to talk about is, it's pronounced Edo, but it looks like Ido. The theories regarding autism have been based on observation of our odd behaviors. List these behaviors and make a diagnosis. I have limited independence and self-care. I have limited eye contact. I have flat uh, effect often. I can't express my ideas verbally. I have poor fine motor control. I have impaired initiation. I have impaired gross motor control. I have difficulty controlling intense emotions. I have impulse control challenges and sensory stimulation behavior. Woo! When I write it uh, like that, it sounds pretty bad, but I function adequately in this world. I am 17 now, and I am a full-time high school student in a general education program. I am in honors chemistry, honors U.S. history, and honors English. I am in algebra 2, Spanish, and animal sciences. I get straight A's. I work out with a trainer two or three times a week to get fit. I study piano. I hike. I cook. I help take care of a horse. I am invited to speak at universities and autism agencies. I am the author of Ido and Autism Land, a blogger as well. I have friends. This is not to brag. I, I say this not to brag, but to let you know people like me with severe autism who act weirdly and can't speak are not less human, as Dr. Lovoff suggested, and are not doomed to live lives of rudimentary information and bored isolation. Lovoff once said, you have a person in a physical sense. They have a hair, a nose, and a mouth, but they are not people in the psychological sense. He said this uh, in an interview with Psychology Today in 1974. Ido goes on to say, I communicate by typing on an iPad with an app that has both word prediction and voice output. I also communicate by using good old-fashioned letterboard pointing. If I had not been point, uh, taught to point at letters or how to type without tactile support, many people never realize, would have realized my mind was intact. My childhood was not easy because I had no means to communicate at all, despite my 40 hours a week of intensive ABA therapy. I pointed to flashcards and touched my nose, but I had no means to convey that I thought deeply, understood everything, but was locked internally. 
meticulously collected data to show my incorrect answers to flashcard drills, but the limitations of theory are in the interpretations. My state mistakes were proved to my instructors of my lack of comprehension or my lack of intelligence. So we did the same boring baby lessons year after boring year, how I dreamed of being able to communicate the truth then to my instructors and my family too, but I had no way to express my ideas. All they gave me was the ability to request foods and basic needs. Here is what I would have told them if I could when I was small. My body isn't under my mind's complete control. I know the right answer to these thrilling flashcards. Unfortunately, my hands isn't fully under my control either. <clears throat> my body is ignoring my thoughts. I look at the flashcards. You ask me to touch tree, for example. And although I can clearly differentiate between tree, house, boy, and whatever other cards you have arrayed, my hand doesn't consistently obey me. My mind is screaming, don't touch house. It goes to house. Your notes say, Ito is frustrated in session today. Yes, frustration often occurs when you can't show your intelligence, and neurological forces impede communication between mind and body, and experts then conclude that you are not cognitively processing human speech. In my childhood, I feared I would remain stuck forever in this horrible trap, but I was truly fortunate to be freed when I was seven, when my mother realized my mind was intact, and both my parents searched for a way to help me communicate without tactile support. Thousands of autistic people like me live lives in isolation and loneliness, denied education, condemned to baby talk and high fives, never able to express a thought. The price of assuming that nonverbal people with autism have impaired thinking is a high one to families and to people who live in solitary confinement within their own bodies. It is high time professionals rethought their theories. Teen locked in autistic body finds inner voice. So this is about Carly Fleshman, who is an activist. Um, she's actually a neurodiversity activist. And again, she is what you would stereotypically consider to be a severely autistic person. It's hard to be autistic because no one understands me. People look at me and assume I am dumb because I cannot speak. There are experts and skeptics that believe nonverbal people like Carly are incapable of thinking or writing. I think a lot of people get their information from so-called experts, but if a horse is sick, you don't ask a fish what's wrong with a horse. You go right to the horse's mouth. There are people who are not speaking on a son's board. There are quite a few of them, actually. Amy here is a non-speaking autistic advocate who, activist excuse me, who loves words and writes free verse poetry. Amy blogs regularly for um, the Autism Women's Network, and she serves uh, on the board of Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technology and the Autism National Committee, and she's presented in several conferences in the U.S. and Canada, and so again, she's a non-speaking advocate and activist. Uh, Benjamin McGann is an autistic adult who lives in Northern Virginia. He's non-speaking and spells to communicate. He's a member of the Arlington Five, a group of non-speaking students who filed a federal complaint against the Arlington Public, school, uh, public Schools for denying non-speaking autistic students access to the general education curriculum. His challenges with inclusion as a non-speaking individual are highlighted recently in his documentary, Boys in the Boat, developed by George Washington University Film School. Um, he is the board member for Non-Speaking Community Consortium. Ben is a member of the Athletes Without Limits rowing team and the Nova Cool Cats ice hockey team. He's a distance swimmer, and he earned a civil, uh, silver medal at the Special Olympics state competition in 2012. And so again, you know, this is this is a non-speaking autistic person who's an advocate for neurodiversity. Cal Montgomery. Cal Montgomery is a stubborn, non-compliant, trans, queer, autistic, physically disabled activist and writer whose particular interest is disability rights. He is a survivor of long-term institutionalization. He is not reliably to toilet trained. He has been given an intellectual disability label. He has a long so a history of self-injurious behavior and spent many years as an adult non-speaker, although today he has intermittent speech. Carl, uh, sorry, Cal is face blind and never did learn to recognize his parents, and he is dyspraxic, which is, again, the inability to, you know, control your body movements the way you want. It currently takes him roughly two hours to dress himself, and it is a spectacularly bad idea for him to attempt to travel uh, by city bus without a companion. He is not under guardianship, much to the regret of another, uh, his mother, an achievement that took no small effort. Cal is also the holder of a bachelor's degree in philosophy, has worked uh, as staff in a number of homes and daycare programs with, um, for people with disabilities, is a contributor to the disability rights publication The Ragged Edge and Mouth, 
and was a presenter at Ott Street for a number of years and has worked for Not Dead Yet and is a member of ADAPT. Cal is probably best known in the neurodiversity community for his essay, Critic of the Dawn, and his work doing direct ab uh, action and civil disobedience against the electric shock level three adversive used at the Judge Rottenberg Center. He is best known in the independent living community for being an enormous pain in the rear end. In other words, like many autistics, Cal Montgomery is a whole lot better at some things than others, and he can be hard to categorize. My friend Sharon, uh, she didn't speak until she was nine years old, and uh, she thinks entirely in images, and the reason why she couldn't speak is because she needed pictures of the images in order to understand how to communicate with verbal language. And so she went to a speech therapist who taught her how to read and gave her pictures to work with. And once she could see the words as pictures in her mind, she could speak. She started speaking at age nine. Now for the part that I should have really avoided because it's highly controversial and you guys are hate me for it, or genetic engineering. And since it looks like autism is largely genetic, I wouldn't be surprised if the focus over the next several years is on the latter, right? Trying to figure out what causes it, what genes play a role so that pregnant women can be offered some sort of screening if they wish, just like we do with Down syndrome. And I believe it's the latter that people are worried about, um, genetic engineering. I don't think that they're worried about medication, even medication that could cure autism, because you can you can either take it or not, right? Um, I think what they're most concerned about is genetic engineering, because it very likely means that we would see far less autistic people being born, just like with Down syndrome. You know, um, I feel like saying it's highly controversial, and you guys are going to hate me for it, kind of pussyfooting around. Um, advocating eugenics, which is what this is, a prenatal test to eliminate autistic people in the womb is eugenics. Um, you know, of course people are going to be upset if you start talking about eugenics, eugenicsing all of the R words out of society. That's something that upsets a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I know that people tend to have uh, beliefs about mentally handicapped people and about how valuable their lives are and about whether or not their lives are even worth living. Um, and when my brother died, you know, some people said some pretty messed up stuff based on those, uh, those assumptions. They said things like, you know, well, he was more like a, a puppy reincarnated into a human body. They thought of him as like, like an animal. And, uh, I don't know, you know, if you personally believe mentally handicapped people shouldn't exist, I would rather just have you, like, say that rather than just saying, oh, you know, people are going to hate me. Um, the term Asperger's comes from the Holocaust. Hans Asperger's was a Nazi eugenicist scientist who chose which autistic people got to die and which autistic people were worthy of being left alive. The discussion of eugenics with autism goes back to the Holocaust. And in history, the, the discussions about eliminating all of the disabled people have had some some pretty bad you know we've had some pretty bad historical times not getting into too many specifics but you know the forced sterilization of disabled people is still a real issue to pretend like you know people are just going to get mad because it's controversial well it's controversial for a reason um and that reason is that you're saying that an entire subset of human beings shouldn't exist because they're mentally handicapped or because they, they're autistic. And some people um, are going to be reminded of the Holocaust by those kinds of statements because of the fact that that's happened before in history, not that long ago. And right now, we are seeing a rise of a lot of really scary fascist type stuff. And I think that that's extremely concerning to be talking about you know, getting rid of all the R words. Um, and so, I mean, if you support eugenics and you believe the world would be a better place if there were no people with Down syndrome, you know, I, I just would have more respect for you intellectually if you could just say that. And, you know, um, Ito, again, the, the nonverbal autistic boy whose book I, I referenced, on his blog, he responded to Richard Dawkins, uh, who made a tweet about how we should get rid of everybody who has Down syndrome. And Ito came out against eugenics. And so here's a person with quote unquote severe autism who cannot speak, who cannot care for themselves, who does not agree with you, um, Swayze. And you know, you, you don't speak for nonverbal autistic people. 
called the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network because we want autistic people to be able to advocate themselves. That's the entire point. And to straw man our movement and to say that what we want to do is to put words in nonverbal autistic people's mouths. Lots of nonverbal autistic people can type. Many more can use sign language. Many more can communicate through like picture boards and stuff like that. And I understand that, that that's not the same thing as verbal communication, um, but it is communication. And you know, there are, there are lots of people like Carly Fletchman um, who are advocating for non-speakers. And many of the people on the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network's board are non-speakers. And again, this is the largest charity for um, autistic people that is a neurodiversity charity. And their board of representatives does not just have people with Asperger's, um, their board of representatives has people all over the spectrum, including people who, you know, have been diagnosed with level three autism, which is the highest support need. And so it's just, it's just fallacious to say that non-speakers are not a part of our movement. You either do not know that non-speakers are part of our, our movement and you're just saying they are because you read this article and the article said that neurodiversity advocates believe X, Y, and Z and you just took that at face value. Um, or, you know, perhaps you're misrepresenting neurodiversity advocates. I, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt because I've, I've seen your content and generally, you know, you're really level-headed and reasonable. And so I assume that it's not intentional, but it does, uh, it does feel misrepresentative and it does feel like, you know, you're misleading people about what our movement represents, um, and about what our movement is actually advocating for. The neurodiversity movement is a civil rights movement, which seeks a lot of very legitimate legitimate grievances. We want things like uh, the end of electric shock on the, the mentally handicapped and autistic. And to minimize our movement and say that it's just a bunch of silly people advocating for silly things because they think that autism isn't a real disorder is uh, really hurtful and condescending. So this is legal to use uh, on the handicapped. How many times a day do you think you were shocked? In the beginning, I was shocked every day. Jennifer Masumba has autism. For seven years, she lived here at the Judge Rotenberg Center in Massachusetts, where she wore a backpack like this one, sometimes 24 hours a day. Inside is a device attached to electrodes that deliver a shock whenever a staffer presses a button on a remote carried on their belt. The center claims it stops bad or aggressive behavior. I felt like I was being punished for being born. That's what it feels like. Because I was disabled, I was being punished. Part of Masumba's treatment plan was for staffers to draw up a list of prohibited behaviors, ranging from head banging to hand movements, for which she could be shocked. I would get like five or ten shocks for just doing one thing. What was that like? That was like being on, under the ground in hell. The center's use of electric shock came under scrutiny in 2012 after this videotape was presented in a court case. It showed 17-year-old Andre McCollins, seen here in the upper right-hand corner, tied to a restraint board by his arms and legs, then shocked 31 times. Andre's now 29. His mother, Cheryl McCollins, settled a lawsuit against the center, but says her son has suffered permanent damage, and she wants shock treatment outlawed. It doesn't work. Shock amount of autism? What is that going to do? Inflicting pain, you, you, it's like you're making the injury worse. That hurts. That hurts. That hurts. Can you describe it for me? It's so scary. I would ask God to make my heart stop, because I didn't want to live. When that was happening to me, I just wanted to die and make it stop. It's easy to control people when you hurt them. It's easy. That's all they've ever done. Instead of showers, I was bathed, tied to a restraint board, naked while staff washed me, putting their hands all over me, all in front of cameras, while the monitoring watched, including men, being tied on a restraint board, naked with my private areas, exposed to the staff in the bathroom and the cameras was the most horrible, vulnerable, and frightening experience for me an anonymous JRC student. Victims in the school wear backpacks equipped with a machine called the GED, which administers electric shocks when a remote control button is pushed. 
the shocks were designed to be extremely painful, and they can leave burns, scabs, and scars on the skin. The shocks may be up to 45 milliamps, while stun guns are typically 1 to 4 milliamps. In at least one student, shocks were often followed by epileptic seizures. Other punishments include spraying people with water, pinching them, or forcing them to eat hot sauce. <sighs> Jesus Christ. The portion program involves starvation, in which a piece of someone's meal must be thrown away for every infraction. There are many reasons why students may be shocked. Screaming covering their ears, fidgeting, trying to take off the electrodes, leaving their seats, throwing papers onto the table, playing with a used paper cup, laughing, crying, using the wrong tone of voice, tensing up, and many more. Sometimes the devices have gone off accidentally. Other behavioral strategies, such as redirecting someone who is misbehaving, are not supposed to be applied. Teachers who do this could be suspended or fired. Paying attention to a student is considered a reward, thus if they are scared, crying, or upset, they are not to be comforted. <sighs> Source right here at the bottom. I can personally attest, having been to ABA, that uh, that's what made me start engaging in self-injurious stims, was the compliance training and them making you pretend that you didn't have autism, and then making you pretend that you weren't the same person that you are. That you are someone that you're not. There is always a price to pay when you pretend to be someone you're not. An ABA therapist may have a very poor understanding of what autism is and why autistic people do the things they do. No training on autism is required. Some autistic people have apraxia, a condition that makes it hard for them to move their body parts, i.e. their hands, they, the way they want to. During ABA drills, an autistic person may be asked to demonstrate intelligence through commands like touch red or touch cat with cards in front of them. If the person has serious apraxia, they may be unable to touch the correct card even though they know what it is. Thus, they may be assumed to be un uh, unintelligent when they are not. A lot of people worry about their violent autistic children as they get bigger and stronger and harder to control, but far too often the violence is stirred up by years of very frustrating therapy. About six months after the therapy started, Jennifer said Adam began to act aggressively. When he got upset, he'd hit, bite, pull people's hair, acting out in ways he'd never done before. Sometimes when the therapist would arrive, he would refuse to go downstairs. All right, so this is also a thing that's really happening. It's uh, autistic people being confined in institutions unjustly. So pleased that the report has, has highlighted these long-term impacts. I managed to fill an entire book with incidents you know, of torture. It was it was often torturous. I was locked in seclusion. I was kept in segregation. I was restrained 97 times. Um, and my book's called Unbroken for for a reason because although I am unbroken, I'm I'm very very traumatized. And that's something that you know those 2,000, 200, 500, however many it is, people are, are going to be traumatized by what's happened to them. You are so articulate. Um, you are bright. How did this happen to you? Well, when I, when my, when you know my autism, let's say symptoms really take over, um, I'm I'm not articulate. I'm not able to speak like I'm talking to you now. Mm -hmm. When I'm in sensory overload, I actually go mute, um, and I stim, you know, repetitively, you know, like this and and like this. And and as Jeremy said, that can look threatening, but if it's managed. If it's just managed, if people just have an understanding of autism, if people are, are supported in a way, you know, that these reports kind of commission, you know, my personal reports, Bethany's reports, these other thousands of people's reports, if we just read those and we know how to support, then I'm sure that a lot of people will be doing perfectly well and happy in their community. Here is an article called, You're Not Trans, You're Autistic. Amy Chandler is 20 years old. She is a transgender individual and she's also autistic. She and others from the trans communities feel they have had their transgender identity undermined by medical professionals because of their autism. This has led to the delaying of gender reassignment procedures. How does it feel to come out as trans only to have to hide autism? Chandler speaks out about juggling these two identities. So many people don't realize this, but because autistic people commonly question gender and society norms, because that is pathologized unfairly, 
we are denied the opportunity to transition if we are transgender in many cases. If, if we have an autism diagnosis, you may not be able to get hormone replacement therapy or other procedures in order to live as the gender that you identify as, but it gets worse. Um, autistic people are actually significantly more likely than the general population to be transgender or non-binary. And so this lack of understanding creates human rights problems. And this is what the neurodiversity movement is about. It's about remedying these serious human rights problems and creating understanding. You know, r regardless of your intentions, again, um, the reality is you're silencing a lot of people whose experiences um, you clearly don't know very much about. You're reading things from articles, and that's that's nice. You know, I appreciate the fact that you're backing it up with evidence to some degree. But again, um, you are not familiar with our community. Very clearly, you're not familiar with our community if you think things like the only people who support neurodiversity have Asperger's. Um, no, someone with autism does not speak for everyone with autism. Just like someone with depression does not speak for everyone with depression. I'm pretty lucky. I have depression, but it's managed very well with my medications. I can support my family, which right now includes two very young kids, one kid under one, the other one about three years old. It's not the easiest thing, but I, I think I manage pretty well. If you asked me if I desperately needed a cure for depression, no, I really don't. It's not the most pressing thing in my life right now. I do pretty well, you know, and, and I'm sure that some aspects of my brain that I like are probably tied to my depression. But, you know, a lot of other people with depression are not nearly as lucky as I am. I want to share a post um, by a so-called low-functioning autistic, a non-speaking autistic, about um, how they prefer to be treated. And so it's called, You Don't Speak for Low-Functioning Autistics. Non-autistic people like to use this line a lot when trying to devalue the statements of autistic people that they deem as high-functioning. So one of those low-functioning people they point to is a counterexample. I am standing up and saying, yes, they do. I do not speak. I do not understand when you speak. Remember when you said those people can't speak is evidence of the label? I need help going potty. I am not proud of it, but it is a fact of life. I need to pee just as often as you do, but my body does not tell my brain that. So sometimes my pants get wet when I remember to put them on. And that makes me low-functioning by your standards. Remember, you said those people need help going to the bathroom is evidence of the label. I cannot make reasonable decisions about finances. I spend hundreds of dollars a month on an internet site that gives me a virtual world in which um, to have friends because the physical world uh, people scare the poop out of me. See previous point about why that's a bad thing. Remember, you said those people can't handle finances for themselves as evidence of the label. I need 24-7 care so I don't hurt myself by accident because I forget what I am doing while I'm doing it, such as cutting an onion with a sharp knife and I wave my hand with a knife still in it. Remember when you said those people need round-the-clock care as evidence of the label. Yep, I fit your bullet list of low-functioning. I don't post arguments against your ableism and attacks on autistic people, not because I agree with you, but because uh, fighting you hurts me. When you claim that I need to be cured, I do not call you out and say mean things because you are being confrontational. It hurts me, not because you are right. You are not speaking for me in my silence. You are speaking over me. I want to tell you what an ass you are, but my head won't let me fight because it hurts for me to argue. While your head lets you be an ass and say untrue things, my head won't let me. I must always be honest, and I must also maintain my calm or I might get violent. This does not prove your point. It only silences me. Silencing me does not mean you are right. It only means you are more willing to be an ass than I am. The high-functioning autistics that argue for rights for me do speak for me. In ways I cannot fight, they defend me. In places I cannot go because of my fears, they stand for me. In groups that scare the poop out of me, they clean the mess for me and stand for me. You who are not autistic do not stand for me. Do not tell me uh, that those people that are capable of fighting your hate do not speak for me. They do. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's kind of like, imagine if I made a video um, where I just like uh, talked about like issues facing the black community and like I was this patronizing. I was just like, oh, people who advocate for Black Lives Matter are actually just, they just, you know, irrationally hate the police. Or, I just said a bunch of like ridiculous straw man shit about Black Lives Matter in order to make my point. It kind of feels like that, you know, watching this video it just feels like nonsense that's just being swung at the wall, just stuff that's not true. Um, it kind of feels like, you know, a white person um, telling black people how to do black people things. 
the other reason I think so many people are against a cure is because of the people, <laughs> some of the most vocal people who are advocating for a cure. You've got your parents feeding their kids insane diets, feeding them bleach, not a joke, uh, spending thousands and thousands of dollars on unsubstantiated treatment, and then you've got Autism Speaks, who made this video called I Am Autism. I work faster than pediatric AIDS, cancer, and diabetes combined. And if you are happily married, I will make sure that your marriage fails. Your money will fall into my hands and I will bankrupt you for my own self-gain. So I get why so many people are against finding a cure, or at least are against the people who are for finding a cure. She goes on in her video to talk about how, you know, she thinks that the reason why some people oppose um, a cure to, to autism is not because they believe that it is, say, scientifically infeasible to cure autism, um, or because of the long history of using eugenics and inhumane treatments against autistic people, especially without their consent, um, but because of some of the organizations that are adv advocating for a cure, like Autism Speaks, which engage in, um, you know, really cruel and questionable behavior. Well, you know, Autism Speaks does spend most of its funding dedicated towards a prenatal test to detect and eliminate autistic people in the womb. And they have, um, in the past, partnered with white supremacist organization, um, I believe Soldiers of Odin, what's the name? Autism Speaks White Supremacy. Soldiers of Odin. Yes. Yep, it's, it's, yeah, it's Soldiers of Odin. Yep. Soldiers of Odin right there. All right. Well, good job, Autism Speaks. You see, uh, they would partner with such an organization, um, again, because they're eugenicists, and they are a eugenics charity, which masquerades as a charity that helps disabled people. You see, uh, the Autism Self-Advocacy Network and like the Autistic Society in the UK. These are charities that want to help autistic people deal with society. Um, Autism Speaks is a charity that wants to help society deal with autistic people. And um, again, you know, the getting rid of all the autistic people stuff and getting rid of all of the mentally handicapped people stuff, uh, that, that has some pretty strong roots and some historical things that are not that far back that are extremely horrific. And yes, it's controversial for that reason, um, because it is eugenics, and many people are, of course, going to talk about the Holocaust because of the fact that autistic people were victims of the Holocaust. But on the other side, to present autism as just neurodiversity, as just living differently, is also inaccurate. With regards to autism, neurodiversity proponents acknowledge that many autistic individuals need a lot of support, and that autistic people may struggle with everyday tasks, and that autism is a disability. However, they argue that the support should treat autistic people's experiences and self-expression with respect, rejecting interventions that train autistic people to pass as neurotypical by suppressing traits that are not actively harmful to themselves or others. Autism rights advocates oppose classifying autism as, as a disease and instead advocate calling it a disability and a difference. Autistic people are not sick, we are different and in need of extra support. Many autism rights advocates see autism as a social model of disability. This idea holds that disability is a social construct caused by society's failure to accommodate different abilities. For example, a nearsighted person has a vision deficit, but the invention of glasses and contacts allows them to participate fully in everyday activities. A blind person may not be able to do ordinary things like reading restaurant menus or reading certain books because braille and audiobook equivalents aren't always available. Thus, disability is not always caused by a deficiency in a person, but sometimes by society's uh, failure to offer options to work around it. Applying the social model disability of autism would mean viewing autistic people as having unique needs instead of uh, tragic deficits and focusing on inclusion, accommodation, and um, support and compassion instead of the extinction of all autistic people. Members of the autism rights movement opposed certain autism treatments such as therapies that force total compliance, quack therapies, violent and painful therapies, uh, therapies that teach autistic people to suppress unusual but harmless behaviors. Many autistic advocates have raised ethical concern over applied behavioral analysis, 
there are questions about whether or not it is humane to train autistic children to suppress their feelings in order to have good or normal behavior, and concerns over instances of physical and emotional abuse. However, this does not mean that the autism rights movement opposes all treatments. The movement supports therapies that empower autistic people to gain new skills and feel more comfortable. If the therapy actually helps the autistic person lead a better life, as opposed to making their behavior more convenient to other people, then any reasonable person will support it. So I, I do believe that this is either, you know, Swayze not understanding the neurodiversity movement and what it actually advocates, or strawmanning the neurodiversity movement. Like if you just did five minutes of cursory Googling, five minutes of Googling, um, you know, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, the Autistic Society in the UK. Like, there's so many different charities that support neurodiversity, and not even all of them are autism charities, because, again, like, uh, traumatic brain injury survivors have taken on neurodiversity, people with ADHD. Um, in fact, people with some mood disorders, like bipolar disorder and depression, have taken the neurodiversity paradigm onward um, in the sense that they believe in, you know, ending the stigma and they believe in providing full accommodation and support and inclusion for disabled people and people with mental illnesses. Again, it's it's a civil rights movement, and we have, like, tenable goals and stuff. It's not just people on Instagram saying things you think are inflammatory. Um, it, it, it's just so uncharitable. It's a, such an uncharitable interpretation of what we believe. It's such an uncharitable interpretation of what we believe. And it's not fair, you know, when people are out there advocating for things like ending uh, filicide and, you know, ending electric shock on the handicapped and ending the forced sterilization and ending, you know, all this stuff, ending uh, autistic people being kept in solitary confinement in the UK, that's a thing. Um, it, it's sad because it's like, you know, I just want to be heard. And neurodiversity advocates, when we advocate against inhumane treatments, a lot of the time people will come in us and they'll go, well, you're opposed to all treatment. And it's like, no, we're, we're opposed to this, this, and this. And then we'll say, well, autism is a difference. And people will say, oh, what are you saying is it's not a disorder? Are you saying people don't suffer because of it? And it's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. You know, that's not what neurodiversity advocates are saying. And then a lot of autism advocates are against the idea of a cure because they are fundamentally opposed to eugenics. Um, because they have strong feelings about eugenics, and that is mischaracterized, again, as not wanting to help autistic people. Um, because the only way to help autistic people is for there to, to be no more autistic people, apparently. The best way to help us is if we all just disappeared. Down syndrome has a pretty big impact on the person who has its character and personality, and many people who have Down syndrome consider it to be a fundamental part of their identity, uh, many mentally handicapped people consider it to be part of their, their identity. My mentally handicapped brother certainly did consider it to be part of his identity. And it was very hurtful for him to have to listen to people say things like, well, you know, I hope one day there's a prenatal test for people like you so that people like you don't exist anymore. And the perception that he wouldn't be hurt by those things because um, he doesn't have Asperger's syndrome or whatever is, is really ridiculous. Um... The, the reality is that mentally handicapped people are hurt by these things, regardless of their diagnosis, regardless of what type of handicap they have, regardless of what kind of developmental disability it is. There is a difference between a disability and a mental illness for a reason, and certain disorders are parts of who you are. This is a part of who I am, and, you know, it would it would drastically alter who I am if I was no longer autistic. It's not just like, oh, there are some things about me that would change, and please... Please stop pretending that severe autism does not exist or that it's only like a few people. Then you can either admit that sometimes autism just sucks no matter how good an environment you're in or blame the parents for not making the environment good enough. And once you've made autism isn't a disease and nobody needs a cure into your rallying cry, it's going to be hard to choose that first option, which is how it used to be. Mothers of autistic children were blamed for being too cold, hence the term refrigerator mom. I see your anger towards people who blame um, parents, but I think that you don't feel the anger and the needs of people in the autism community. Many of us have been subject to some pretty horrendously cruel uh, therapies and treatments, and we have a lot of very legitimate reasons for criticizing these parents. So when a person goes on a, um, 
her raw foodist Instagram and says something like, well, you know, autism isn't an illness. Um, autism doesn't need a cure. It is, I think, an incredibly uncharitable interpretation of that to assume that what they mean is that autism, you know, doesn't need any support or treatment or that autism cannot be profoundly disabling. I think that you're, it's, it's an uncharitable interpretation because, you know, if you just empathize um, with what we've been subjected to and how shitty people treat us and how excluded we are and how um, many parents really do resent their kids for being disabled, that is a real thing that happens. Many people in the autism community are, are estranged from their parents, you know. Their parents uh, don't talk to them anymore, including my mom. My mother, the very last thing she said to me was, you know, if I had known you turn out fucking autistic, I never would have gotten you vaccinated. Like, that was the last thing my mother said to me. And to deny um, the sociological impact is, is really irresponsible. There is no false dichotomy between, you know, the evil neurodiversity advocates wanting to accept autistic people and the ter terribly sad poor parents who are just misunderstood and they're just trying to help their kids. There's no d dichotomy between those two things. Non-speaking autistic people also have advocated against fears. Their, their reality is that people's opinions, autistic people's opinions on whether or not they would personally cure their autism, um, there have been some surveys that have indicated most people are against quote-unquote a cure, but even though most people are against quote-unquote a cure, um, there are still some people who would. And the neurodiversity movement has advocated doing everything we can to include and provide medical treatment for the suffering caused by autism. We just would also like people to accept the difference. For example, the dyspraxia and the apraxia, which causes, you know, people not to be able to control their hand movements, and it may, um, you know, makes where you can't control your body movements or speak. Yeah, we want, we want research and medical treatment for that. Um, but we would also like the acceptance of, like, harmless behaviors like hand flapping. Do we want to self-injure? No, that's a bad thing. Self-injury is a bad thing. Um, and we don't want to self-injure, but, you know, like, again, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and you're also speaking over non-speaking autistics by making these claims, and you're also speaking over people who are more severely handicapped with a variety of different developmental disabilities by making these, these kinds of claims. And again, and again, you know, um, the reason why I wanted to, to bring these ashes, um, is because, you know, I, I don't, I don't think people understand like, I was 16, and I was homeless, and I was caring for my mentally handicapped terminally ill brother, despite being autistic, um, until he died. And, you know, it's because my parents, uh, my mom didn't give a shit about us. Um, and there are, there are some people in that situation, but, you know, what I want to say is that, like, people like Jeremy, he was so funny, and he was so amazing and bright, and he couldn't, you know, he was in a diaper for his entire life. Um, and he, um, you know, had to have an oxygen machine and he had 30% usage of his, uh, lungs and, you know, the heart problems and stuff, but he always knew how to make you laugh. Uh, he loved He-Man. <laughs> he loved Pokemon. I want to show you, um, my Pokemon tattoo I got from my brother. Um, we both loved Pokemon. So these are some of his favorite Pokemon and some of my favorite Pokemon together. This is my tattoo for him. It's not done yet. Um, when it's done, it's gonna, it's gonna have his name on the banner. And there's a Pona from Legend of Zelda with the fairies. Um, but you know, I loved my brother. And, um, if you asked him about his disability, um, what he used to say was that he didn't mind being mentally handicapped. Obviously, the physical impairments, the congestive heart failure and the, the lung problems, he didn't like that and he wanted to get rid of that. But being mentally handicapped and, and struggling as a result of his mental handicap um, was not something that, you know, although, although he did struggle as a result of it, it was not something that he considered to be not part of his identity. Again, it was part of who he was. And despite the fact that he was mentally handicapped, <clears throat> he had this most amazing talent in the world. He could do something that, like, I've never seen anybody do. He, without ever being taught or without ever being trained, just picked up an electric guitar one day, and he just started shredding. He just knew how to play the guitar. No one had ever taught him. He knew how to play the guitar perfectly. And when we asked him, you know, how, how do you know how to play the guitar, Jeremy? And he said, well, I watched people do it on TV. And we're like, okay, all right, that's, that's as good an answer as any, right? Um, 
But, you know, he was an amazing person. Um, and I don't know, it just breaks my heart to hear people sit here and say stuff like, well, you know, the only people who want handicapped people to exist are mildly handicapped people, as if n no one has ever loved a person who has a severe disability. And you could say that it's selfish that I want my brother to exist and that I would like him to have existed. Um, but I would disagree. I, I think people like my brother have a right to exist. I think that people like my brother deserve to be included <clears throat> and they deserve to be treated like human beings and part of that means no longer entertaining discussions uh, on the internet about whether or not we should um, remove all of the inferiors from the gene pool um, because that's that's what you're advocating for you know don't pretend for a second that the reason why it's not you know the reason why it's so controversial to talk about hearing autism is because it's not eugenics Nazi shit. It is eugenics Nazi shit. Lots of eugenics Nazi shit. And of course that's going to be controversial. There's a long history of pain and misery associated with this. Um, you know, a very, very large chunk of autistic people have post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, maybe you should ask yourself why so many autistic people have post-traumatic stress disorder. And before you make a video on the internet talking about how a civil rights movement, which seeks to end things like the use of uh, electric shock on the handicapped and the forced sterilization of people who are mentally handicapped or autistic against their will, um, before you talk about how that movement is just a bunch of silly people advocating for silly things, you know, I, I think that it would be wise to read about the movement and to talk to people who are in the movement. It really just feels so dishonest and it, it's hurtful, regardless of whether you intended it to be hurtful. Regardless of, you know, intentions, we can hurt people. Um, this is a book that I recommend to Unnatural Vegans called Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism in the Future of Neurodiversity by C. Silverman. Um, it's a great book about the history of unethical autism treatments and the future of neurodiversity and what it actually means, because neurodiversity is not about not supporting things that improve the lives of autistic people. It's about viewing autism through the lens of disability, and it is also about viewing autism um, through the lens of the social model of disability, when and where applicable. And notice I said when and where applicable, so please do not misrepresent me by saying I wholly reject the medical model of, you know, disability. But the social model of disability uh, states that, you know, what is a disability is contextual, depends upon, you know, the rules within a society. The example would be like, if, if everyone on earth was deaf, um, and you were the only person that could hear, you would probably be diagnosed with a terrible sensory disorder and there would be organizations dedicated to curing your hearing and even if you said you know there may be really bad sounds in the world that i hate and i don't like experiencing them but i like hearing sometimes and i think i should have the choice to decide whether or not i get to hear a lot of people would probably look at you like you were you know you had two heads and they would say oh this poor delusional child they don't understand they have a disability something's wrong with them they need to be fixed if you removed my autism i would never have struggled with self-injury yes i would never have uh freak outs at fireworks shows yes i would be able to drive a car you know i wouldn't have been discriminated against at work um you know lots of things about my life would improve but you know the thing you're missing out on is that it would also fundamentally and completely change who i am as a person it would not mildly change who i am as a person many autism advocates instead advocate for treatments for the disabling aspects of autism like the lack of mind body control that prevents a lot of autistic people from being in full control of their body movements and we advocate for Things like, uh, you know, speech therapy and anything and everything to accommodate an autistic person and, and help them, you know, adjust into the world. And we would like very much, neurodiversity advocates very much want to see every single service brought to the table for autistic people to give them the best lives possible. But we would also like to recognize that living the best life possible does not necessarily mean living the most normal life possible because we are not normal. We're, we're different and we, we need to be accepted. It's killing us not to be accepted. There's an autism advocate um, who does an Ask an Autistic series on YouTube and she used to suffer from head, head banging and she is also a, a neurodiversity advocate 
and uh, as part of her advocacy, ad advocacy, she did a um, day of remembrance, the day of mourning for the disabled, uh, which is something that neurodiversity advocates have set up to mourn disabled people who've been killed by their caregivers and their parents and their family members. And so, you know, this straw man of what the activism that Swayze says we're doing is just YouTube comments, Facebook comments, Instagram comments saying, you know, things that she thinks are inflammatory versus what the movement actually represents. A woman bearing her soul here saying disabled people don't deserve to be murdered by their parents is what our movement represents. Saying um, that we don't think autism is a real disability or whatever is just so disingenuous. <laughs> and it undermines everything that we fought for. You know, the, the reality of the situation is that we're a highly marginalized group of people, you know, and it, it's just not acceptable to mischaracterize our struggles like this. It's just not. It's not acceptable to mischaracterize our struggles as blaming parents. You don't understand what we're up against. And, you know, you, you compare it to depression because you don't get it. You don't understand that this is, this is more like how if I wasn't a woman anymore, I wouldn't be the same person anymore. You know, like being a woman doesn't define me. Being a woman isn't a, a good thing or a bad thing. It just is a thing that some people are. But, you know, it's an inherent part of my identity. And throughout the video, you refer to autistic people as people with autism. And uh, most autistic people, you know, when you look at various surveys of like, do you prefer to be called autistic person or do you prefer to be called person with autism? Most people answer that they prefer to be called an autistic person because it's it's core to their identity. There's no with, you know. And so for me, calling me a person with autism is like calling me a person with femaleness because my gender is just as relevant to me as my autism in terms of how it affects my identity. It's not just a series of behaviors or a series of quirks. It's literally the way that I think and process the world. It's the way that I experience the world. It affects my interests. It affects the kinds of friends that I want to have. You know, if, if you gave me a cure, um, I sincerely believe that I would be a completely different human being with different interests, I would have different hobbies, I would make different friends, I would dress differently, I would probably like like different foods, I wouldn't like the same music anymore, um, you know, I mean, like literally everything about me would, would be different. And, you know, the, the choice for me is like, do I be myself every day? And that's a brave choice when you're walking into a world that doesn't accept you. That's a brave choice, you gotta make that choice, you gotta decide. Um, what's more important to you? Authentically living as the person you really are. Or pretending to be normal so other people will accept you. Every day I keep living. And every day I say, no, I don't want to kill myself. I'm proud of the fact that I am who I am. I'm proud to be autistic. Every day I say these things, I am acting defiantly. I am defying a really cruel and an ex and an inexclusive society, you know, and an, 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 a society that seeks to exclude me and mistreat me on the basis of who I am, a society that, that has left me alienated and alone many times, a society that has told me that um, my brother, because he's mentally handicapped, um, is essentially just like a pet, like an animal that I take care of, and not like a real person, um, and that people like him shouldn't exist. <laughs> And that people like him shouldn't be born anymore. And that people like me shouldn't be born anymore. And that the world would be a better place if people like us didn't exist. And in the face of all of that, I stand up and I say no. Um, every day, I say no. And I keep living. And I keep being myself. Um, and I keep authentically. Autisming autistically. <laughs> And it's hard, but it's worth it. Because, you know, you're sacrificing something when you're pretending to be someone you are. No matter what the difference is, whether we're talking about a difference that isn't a disability, like being gay and pretending you're not gay, or whether the difference also can be a negative thing, like with autism, where it is both a difference and a disability. But to deny who I am is not something I can do anymore. And so here I am bravely standing uh, in defiance 
of a society that thinks the best way to help me is to make sure people like me are not born anymore rather than to consider the possibility that their preconceived notions are wrong and that um, autistic people need support and inclusion and acceptance and yes medical treatment to alleviate the suffering caused by the disability but I, I strongly implore you not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and I strongly encourage you to put yourself in my shoes and imagine how hard it is to live authentically as who you are when people are so shitty and I want you to imagine what it's like to have people talk about you talk about curing you when it's something that is again part of who you are um they talk about it like it's like it's like it's like it's depression or something you know it's just like an extra autism is not an extra autism is not topping you know on the on the sunday that you can just take off autism is the sunday autism is my brain it's how my brain develops autism um is why you know at the age of like three I could read it at college level and you know autism also means that you know I couldn't relate to other kids my own age because I would read the dictionary or the encyclopedia or like my mom's veterinary medical textbooks and um you know I would just recite things from them to people that was my way of socially interacting and other kids didn't want to play with me very much because of that and you know some people might think that that's a tragedy um but but the reality is that um with support and with love a lot of autistic people can you know can do really really well in society and those people that can't right now desperately need research to be dedicated towards treatments that are going to improve their quality of life and you know most of uh the research for autism goes towards this genetic testing stuff that's like really long haul if there is going to be some sort of cure um it would be a probably a prenatal test to eliminate aut eliminate autistic people in the womb that would be the most likely in my personal opinion um but you know if if such a thing did happen it certainly wouldn't benefit autistic people who are alive today and most of the autism research money goes towards not towards services uh for people who really need them not towards services for people who you know are most severely impacted um, and almost none of their research goes towards researching the mind-body disconnect issues that cause autistic people to have trouble controlling their body movements, even though autistic people have been begging researchers to put money into that because uh, many non-speaking autistics say that is actually the primary reason why they can't communicate, but they're being ignored and they're being told that they don't have a voice um, by people who just want to straw man the neurodiversity movement as this movement of people who are just silly and don't think autism is a real disability and you know um take it from me as a person who's who's been up and down with with my autism um yeah it's, it's a disability but it's also fundamentally completely part of who i am like if you don't accept my autism like we can't be friends you know like it's it's like not accepting me because i'm gay or something it's not like um a mood disorder I'm sorry it's not you know it's it's just not comparable at all to a mood disorder um, and so you know I, I would just encourage you um, Miss Swayze if you're if you're watching this please read about the neurodiversity movement um, you know this is a book I recommend Neuro Tribes by Steve Silverman it's really great I would implore you to read about the neurodiversity movement I would implore you to talk to neurodiversity advocates. I would implore you to, you know, educate yourself about what it is that we actually believe and what it is that we actually advocate for. Um, you know, like I said, pretty good book. It's pretty legit. Well, anyways, um, thank you guys uh, for watching. <sighs> like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell notification. Um, I am gonna go autism autistically somewhere else. Until next time, when I have a conversation about why disabled people are offended when we talk about removing them all from society. Why would anybody be offended by that? What? Why would anybody be offended by the suggestion we should get rid of all of the crippled people? What's wrong with that? Why would anybody... I know people are going to hate me for saying we should get rid of all of the crippled people.
but I mean, like, low key, we should get rid of all the crippled people. Why would that offend anybody? And they say that I'm the one who doesn't understand social um, norms. But, you know, shit, I've never once thought to comment on whether or not you have the right to exist. <laughs> Holy shit. Damn.